Welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. My name's Will Duffin. This series is for paramedics, doctors, nurses, physios, anyone working in healthcare who has a curious mind, who isn't afraid to go against the grain, push the limits and strike out into new uncharted territory. And today's guest has done just that. I have the pleasure of welcoming Mark Beaumont. He's a long distance cyclist and author who lives with his wife and two kids in Edinburgh, Scotland. His first career defining adventure was in 2008 when he cycled 18,000 miles around the world unsupported in 194 days, beating the previous world record. And that's a journey that was uh, captured by the BBC and immortalized in, in his book, The Man That Cycled the World. And he returned 10 years later, faster, stronger, and even more determined, this time with a support team to complete the same feat in just 79 days. But that's not all. He's also cycled the length of Africa. He's rowed to the magnetic North Pole and attempted to row the Atlantic amongst a number of other feats of human endurance. And this, in this episode, we're going to explore some of Mark's motivations, his highs and lows, his triumphs and disasters. Mark, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Thanks for... Uh... Thanks for the warm introduction. Good to see you again. I think it was at the conference last time we caught up. That's right. Yeah, it was uh, your your talk at the conference was really, really well received. And it's great to, to have you back in the fold at, at World Extreme Medicine. Well, it's uh, a strange times, isn't it? Sort of catching up remotely, but it's also a great opportunity to sort of um, dream about adventures, share stories, hopefully, you know, inspire a little bit. You know, we've got time at home with our kids, which is definitely a silver lining. My, my two daughters have never been happier. So, yes, great. So, yeah, tell me a bit about how life is in lockdown for you uh, up in Edinburgh. Well, I'm, I'm somebody who spends half of my life traveling and at events. So to be at home for months on end is 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 very odd. You know, I just came back from expedition in Chile and, you know, I was meant to be in Malawi right now, but um Hey, being being stuck in Edinburgh, there's worse places to be. Um, the kids are happy. Nikki, my wife, uh, the dog, uh, everyone who you know are in my household are 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 safe and well. And at the end of the day, that's what matters most. Um, for sure, work is going to take a massive hit this year. But um, you know, anyone who does what I do, you know, I've got different strands to to my work. Be it the broadcasting, the the travel, the events, the conferences. Um, I've also got sort of a corporate career that they're all being impacted hugely. And, um, you know, whether you're a healthcare worker or, or working in sort of a, a corporate industry, um, you know, there's going to be massive shocks to deal with at the moment. You know, none of us have lived through this. So uh, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. But um, I keep zooming out, as I'm sure you do, from the micro to the macro. On the micro level, we're fine. On the macro level, there's a lot to concern. But but equally, you try and like in an expedition mindset, think, well, what can I affect and what can't I affect and trying to stay wake up every day and, you know, be positive. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I, the only thing that's changed right now is everything and that certainly on the macro level, that is the case. But I completely take your point about really focusing on the little things that we can control and in, in the, the small things day to day certainly for me i uh, haven't changed a lot like you i've got a family and now uh, you know we just try and enjoy each day get out in the sun with our small amount of exercise that we're able to have and and just try and make the most of it and make this a live time rather than dead time exactly exactly it, and, and i think i think what's super important during periods of uncertainty is is routine you know we're, we're creatures of habit and when our habits are thrown in the air, we feel huge sort of insecurity and, and, and worry and stress. So I think we need to create new habits pretty quickly, even if they seem a bit silly, you know, whatever that is in your day. So, I mean, like, you know, so you can go out for exercise once a day and I want to spend quality time with my kids and I can do that more than ever, but I've still got to work really hard. So I decided to use my daily, my daily sort of run around the block if you like to to spend quality time with my daughter which i would never get to do so she cycles with me she's six i run and our mission is to you know from from the doorstep in in edinburgh uh explore loads of different streets i was i was inspired by the ricky gates documentary where he ran every single street in san francisco so i've been on a little mission to explore every single street within a stone's throw of where i live oh brilliant that's so nice that you're doing that with your daughter as well and Maybe this will, while you're back at home and you're not out on the road like you often are, it'll give you a chance to spend some quality time with her. 
Yeah, I mean, as a six-year-old, if she goes back to school in the autumn having peddled every street in Edinburgh, that would be a cool little mission. Yeah, it would. It really would. <laughs> so, Mark, let's let's chat a little bit about some of the quite incredible things that you've done. What I'd like to do to start with, just go back to the beginning. Um, how is it that you first got into cycling ridiculous distances? Well, I would say I would say early doors that I wasn't like I wasn't a passionate cyclist, passionate cyclist as a kid. I wasn't in a club. I wasn't trained. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't groomed. I wasn't part of some some scene where I was sort of destined to be a tour rider. I was a homeschooled kid in the Highlands of Scotland, where I, um, you know, I was just working on the farm. So myself and my two sisters didn't go to school till we were twelve, and every morning there was a farm to run. We spent a couple of hours around the kitchen table, but most of our time was just spent outdoors. So that sense of, you know, being quite self-reliant and, you know, a sense of grit and, you know, hard work, you know, we're totally used to that because I was never in a playground. I was never in a classroom. Um, But probably until I was 15, my main sport was riding, horse riding, because I grew up on a farm with loads of horses. Um, And then skiing really became my biggest passion. By the time I went to high school, it was much closer to go up to Glen Shee than it was to go down to school in Dundee. It was a 60 mile round trip to school. So, um, I, I mean, I was a ticket, a season ticket holder and I spent my entire teenage years skiing. And it was only really later on in my teenage years and then through university that cycling became more important. And I think that's important to say because my passion was always just getting out there and exploring wild places. It was never like, being competitive in fact I've always been quite shy of competition because when I went to high school and found I was terrible at rugby and football and everything that was sort of the norm in the playground you know that really got battered out of me you know I was sort of gently teased and bullied because you know I was a homeschooled kid who had never you know imagine going from the farm to a to a playground with 1200 kids in it at the age of 12 so any definition of sport normal sport sort of uh, intimidated me uh, my escape was the mountains. My escape was going skiing, going horse riding, going cycling. And, you know, I was 12 when I pedaled across Scotland, 15 when I cycled Land's End, John O'Groats. As soon as I left school, you know, I was doing big trips through Europe, length of Italy, through Scandinavia. So it grew fairly organically. I was a ski instructor over in Italy. But, I mean, I was pretty academic as well. So I thought I'd get an economics degree and work in finance. It was only really post-university that I thought, hell, why don't we cycle around the world and what's the worst that can happen? It was more of a post-university, you know, year out than it was me planning to start a career in this. I mean, yeah. I'm now 37 and the last 15 years is, has been a, a hell of a ride. It's been it's been exciting, but it certainly wasn't the plan. That's amazing because that's a, it's a slight departure for most people's career trajectory from a degree in economics working in the kind of corporate uh, world to then reinvent yourself as a a professional athlete, an author and broadcaster. Um, And I think that's really inspiring for all of the medics who who think they've just got a degree in medicine and they are destined to just be one thing to work cold face on on the wards when actually it just takes one leap and that can open up this just Mm. world of of possibility. Well, for sure. And I mean, I think probably the network that you've got at World Extreme Medicine involves a lot of outliers. <laughs> I know from, you know, the Dr. Andrew Murray's, the Laura Penholes, the you know, these these characters have taken, you know, a medical training, be that as a physio or a, or a doctor, and kind of brought a real entrepreneurial spark to it. They've said, right, I've got a core skill set and I'm going to take it in a different direction. And quite a few of them have ended up with portfolio careers where they're not, you know, they're not doctors in a traditional sense, but they're they're still creating huge impact. And, you know, I've got a lot of respect for that. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, if you want to be a, you know, a career medic doctor, or you want to be a career accountant, that's absolutely fine. But um, as long as you feel like you're in the driving seat for your career, as long as you feel like you're making your choices. I know many, so many people getting to my age, like sort of, you know, mid-career, mid-life and going, hell, I'm, I'm bright, like I, I was a straight A kid. I, you know, I had the education and I've got to mid age and I've not actually made a single choice in my life. Like I've just been sort of fast tracked into the career that I've got. So, you know, you get to this age and you've got a bit of financial security. You've, you know, you've maybe got a family and, and you sort of start to question 
the decisions that happened with you for you early on in your career like how much was I really sort of making those decisions for myself so you know I've just stepped down as the rector at the University of Dundee um, and I still stay heavily involved in um, university sports in Scotland I'm honorary president of Scottish student sports and in roles like that my greatest passion is to make sure that students and young people actually stop and think what do I want to do what are my choices here not just what am I expected to do? And I know that sounds a bit sort of glib and obvious, but it's fundamental. You know, there's so much peer pressure and expectation. My big sister is an educational psychologist. So she works with kids who are falling out of the education system. And I think that's an amazing role and responsibility. But I actually worry for the the the, the equal and opposite. I worry for the brightest kids in our country who get fast tracked through school and university and medics are in the top flight of that uh, and then end up in careers which, you know, they potentially never actually paused and thought, well, what is it within this that really gets me out of bed in the morning? So that entrepreneurial spark within mm. any career, whether you work for, you know, the biggest organization mm. out there or you're a one man band is just yeah. feel it feeling like you you own it and you're passionate about what you do. Absolutely. And I think that entrepreneurial spark that you you refer to, that really unifies all of the medics within our network. They're people who are, aren't just prepared to accept the status quo, that are looking to really push the limits and, and really see what they're capable of doing. And I think mm. the whole paradigm of medical training goes against that. It's a uh, very linear hierarchical training route we yeah. work up the training grades from um, medical student junior doctor uh registrar etc to consultant and if you don't look outside of that you'll end up like you say you know, late late 30s 40s thinking how did i get here um this isn't where i want to be and um i think that that entrepreneurial spirit that we're trying to engender as much as possible in our, our medical colleagues um it's a it's a way of really enabling people to find the the route that is right for them and and uh, gives them lasting uh, career and life satisfaction yeah it's exactly what and i think done. And, so, and i think yeah. it's also i think it's also understanding that i mean it's exactly the same in finance and i've got mm. a finance career i mean i run a small investment fund i yeah. you know I, I advise on a number of businesses in terms of strategy and planning but i've done that with a background and with a life I still lead as an athlete and as a broadcaster. So I like, you know, for, for me, that works. I like the portfolio. I like that portfolio, portfolio approach. But um, I think that the important thing to realize is when you're younger, you think it's about what you know. So, so what you know and the information you can remember gets you so far. So being book smart. And um, there comes a point where you hopefully get valued because of who you are rather than what you know. So there, there becomes a tipping point in any career where I hope people are valued on a more individual basis. I mean, it, it means that you're less replaceable, which is a good thing. But it also means that you're valued because of your life experience, your, your ability to cope under pressure. You know, if I was to think of my last project where about 40 people worked for me, the people who left the project didn't leave because they didn't know what to do. They left because of their, um, they left because of their behavioral change under pressure. So it was not to do with an academic no or, or like a like a skill set. It was purely, you know, about who they were as people and their ability to communicate. And so I think I think that sort of switch in people's minds, sort of the classic what got us here won't take us there. You know, when you take on more responsibilities and leadership and strategy roles, it's not really about we don't live in a meritocracy. It's not how much, you know. It's, it's genuinely about like your ability to cope with pressure, workload, prioritization. And that, that sense of, that sense of control and purpose is, is, is an interesting switch for people in their careers. I think people yes. sometimes find that difficult. I mean, I'm crikey, I'm not saying I always get it right, but it's something I'm very yeah. aware of. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, certainly medicine um, as an institution is very enamored with the letters after your name and the, the early parts of your training the emphasis is very much on getting all of your uh, all of the exams done there's a, a huge number of exams and uh, I think somewhere along the line many of us lose track that actually the skills that will progress us forwards in life and enable us to be the the, the best uh, practitioners of, of medicine that we can be aren't the the ones that, that give us letters after our name they're the the non-technical skills uh, all the, the the characteristics of good leadership and and 
functioning in, in, in teams and, uh, and all of that, which I think in, in many cases gets lost along the way. And I, know, and I know it might be a poor example, but um, I mean, I'm clearly not the world's best bike rider. I'm 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 not the best bike rider in Edinburgh, and yet you know I've broken the circumnavigation twice, top to bottom, and hold, held all these endurance records. I don't think I've managed to to really succeed in endurance sport because I am the best in a nuts and a bolts sense. Yeah, sure, I'm a strong bike rider, but it's very much about my approach. You know, my beliefs, my belief systems, my my ability to pull a team together and all the softer skills around, you know, finance and time management and just getting the job done. I mean, people come to me every single day with their big dreams. And I always sort of say, look, shoot for the stars, but, you know, learn learn your apprenticeship, like know what it takes to get there. Don't just fall out of bed and think you can cycle around the world. So do dream big, but, you know, appreciate that you've got to work hard to, but also appreciate that most of these ambitions never get to the start line because people, people sort of, underestimate the complementary skill sets. They think to cycle around the world is purely about your ability as a bike rider. I can imagine it's the same in medicine. You know, you passed your exams and therefore I know what I'm doing. Whereas, you know, the reality is, you know, it's the life experience bit, you know, the the silly things about prioritization or 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 just sort of turning up when other people don't. You know, it's just it's silly things which ultimately get people ahead and allow them to perform. If you think back at, you know, the real 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 sort of career defining life affirming moments are they're very rarely sort of moments of sort of ac- academic sort of bliss they're just they're moments where you, you you you're you're grafting hard you're being accountable you're shouldering responsibilities you're getting the job done and you look back and go hell that was awful but man i'm proud you know I, the team around me and you know what made that possible was just the culmination of of effort commitment and everything else and it's the same with expeditions you know mm-hmm. I really like your your approach whereby you you have to you have to have have big dreams shoot for the stars as you say but also you need to know how to how to put the nuts and bolts of a of a trip together um and get like you say get the job done it, it, tell us more about your a bit more about your approach what's made you successful in the world records where so many others before you have failed um okay so i mean the the, the at simplest, um, I'm never trying to break anyone's record. Okay. So, um, you know, that, that wall behind me is full of memorabilia from records and expeditions. And, you know, with due respect to the history of the sport that I love, you know, mainly cycling, but I've done a lot of mountaineering and ocean rowing and Arctic and other stuff as well. Um, you know, I'm a great student of that world. I love reading about it and learning about it and being inspired by what other people have done. But I've never, ever planned a trip off another person's trip. So, you know, the first time I cycled around the planet, it was an 18,000 mile race. I, I simply set out with my plan to ride a century a day, 100 miles a day, which would get me around the planet in half a year. I came home within eight hours of my plan. So the comparative success was breaking the previous record by months. And that's what, you know, really made, made the news. Um, but it really got me thinking about this quite simple fact, you know, your target is also your limit. So your target is hugely powerful, but human nature, we always justify where we end up. So you'll always say, oh, I left it all out there. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Man, that was a hard shift. I couldn't, it, you know, to keep ourselves sane, we always just justify, you know, our own performances. And you're pushing it, you're out your comfort zone, and therefore it's natural to say, well, I couldn't have done more. Uh, but that is such a, the psychology of that is so complex. We've got to realize quite simply, your target is your limit. You never do better than what you set out to do. So you need to figure out what you're going to do very clearly. You don't wake up every day and just think, well, how do I feel? What am I going to do? You do all that big thinking before you start and then you read it off script. I mean, to kill the romance of expeditions. I'm not somebody who's (laughs) just sitting out there and going, right, I've trained hard. Let's see what happens. So the, the second time I cycled around the world 10 years later, we broke the previous world record by 37%. I broke my target by 1.44%. So it was based on a plan of 75 days riding, three days flights, two days contingency. So for every continent of the planet, I had four continents to ride across. I had 12 hours contingency. I mean, the, the margins on this were tiny 
I stressed to the team, if we if we messed around for five minutes every time I got off the bike, that would add a day to the world record. I mean, the margins are tiny. And yet I came home. So so if you if you think of that sum, 75 days riding, three days flights, two days contingency, I came home and the current record is 78 days, 14 hours, 40 minutes. I used 14 hours of my 48 hours contingency. That's over an 18,000 mile race. So that's not an accident. Like you don't you don't hit a record by 1.44% without getting obsessed on the planning. And, you know, with respect to Andrew Nicholson, who came before me, I was never trying to break his record. It wasn't a like for like at all. So how do I do that? I mean, my, my team and I do proper bottom up planning, not what's gone before, not let's just beat last year or next best, but genuinely, what are the inputs to this plan? Not what are the outputs? Because you can't affect how far you're going to ride every day. You can affect your time on the bike, your sleep patterns, that's your recovery, and your inputs in terms of food and hydration. There are four things. So if I control those things and figure out what sustainable looks like, so what do my, my blocks on the bike look like? What do my recovery sets look like? How am I fueling this effort? Then that'll take me a vastly different distance each day. But it's a very simple sum. I figured out I could ride 16 hours a day, five hours sleep a night, 8,000 calories a day, eight to 10 liters of water. And those are inputs. The fact that it might take you 200 miles or 280 miles is not something that you can think about psychologically. Um, so I ended up averaging 240 miles a day every single day for two and a half months. But the powerful thing about a target like that is most bike riders would just go out there and say, I'm trying to hit a mileage every day. And if you don't hit it, you get mentally beaten up. And if you do hit it, you get a bit complacent the next day. So you're better just to not worry about how far you go every day. Don't worry about your micro successes. Just trust that the long-term average will take care of itself because all you care about is your behavior. All you care about is the inputs. All you care about is the things you can actually affect. So once you've gone through that very sort of analytical process, it's, it's, it's simple. The world can, cr can throw hell at you and you just go, it's fine because I can't actually affect that. And this is what I can affect. So when I wake up at half past three in the morning and, you know, I, f you know, I feel bruised, broken. There's a storm raging outside. There's no part of me going, am I inspired? What do I do today? What are the big decisions to be made? That's not a moment in time where you should be looking for, um, a, you know, a light bulb bit of inspiration just fall back on process there's no big questions to be answered I, i'm you know you've got to be honest you know a shit day feels shit you've got to you've got to call it what it is i hate it when people wrap up these big projects in sort of rosy tinted retrospect and say it's about being positive and motivated no it's not it's about knowing what job needs done being process driven and being accountable just be consistent and the 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 success will take care of itself Oh, so yeah, consistency is the the key. And I um, one thing I've noted from from your trips is uh, in the in the performance space, if you're if you're really trying to push the limits, uh, control is a huge part of it. Managing all of the facets of performance to to shave off the your your time and maximize your distance each day. But as you as you um, indicated there, so much is outside of your control. And and throughout all of your expeditions, you've faced a number of setbacks uh you've had a lot of mechanical problems with your bikes uh, at one point you even got knocked off your bike uh can you tell us a little bit about those setbacks and how you dealt with those and how you were able to reconcile those against your mind when you were so driven you were you know really trying yeah. to push the distance each day how did you how did, how did you manage those yeah i mean i mean anyone who's ever been on a big expedition or or run a big project will know that there's just moments where the entire project is derailed. You know, the last race around the planet when I was at the World Extreme Medicine Conference talking on stage with, with Laura Penhall, my performance manager, you know, we were talking about how um, we had a blinding start for eight days from Paris to Moscow, cleared Europe in less than a week, averaging over 240 miles a day. And then day nine crashed pretty hard in the dark, in the wet, in the morning. And, um, because I ended up fracturing my radio head, so just taking a, taking a knock through my elbow. And uh, 
And then I had some very wobbly teeth and my canine tooth was sort of cracked. So the front of it came off. So you imagine you're trying to shovel uh, 8,000 calories down a day and you're trying to ride the bike uh, 16 hours a day and you've got, um, you know, time trialing and you've got, uh, you've got a, a cracked elbow and cracked teeth. Um, it's pretty hard to pick yourself up and carry on. I think the adrenaline gets you going pretty quickly. But uh, once that passes, you know, the suffering really <laughs> continues and you've got to sort of think your way through it. And there's a lot of pain management. I think, you know, again, people think it's about inspiration and positivity. It's not. It's about, I think it's about the opposite. You know, you're scared of failing. When you set yourself up to a task like this, it's a big, expensive project. A lot of people rely on you. Safety has to come first. But ultimately, if you fail, everyone fails. So... So, when, so you're saying you're driven by a, desire, a fear of failure and not a desire to succeed? Yes, I think you've got to be, you've got to have both. So when you're setting off to do something worthwhile, you've got to be you've got to be a big blue skies thinker. You've got to be inspired by the art of the possible. You've got to be driven to do something that's never been done before. You've got to be able to imagine and fixate on what success looks like. But then when you're in it and when things are going horribly wrong, you can't. You can't be in that mindset. You've got to be. You've got to be scared of failing. You've got to be running away from something. It's got to matter more than anything else. You've got to have the ability to suffer because if if not, you're not going to ride the bike with a broken tooth and fractured elbow. You know, it's um, it's just a harsh reality which people want to avoid when they're talking about big projects. They just think it's about sort of, you know, focusing. Trust me, when you I've cycled around the planet twice, it's not about the finish line and a bit of paper on the wall like that. It's about being able to get through these moments when the entire project gets derailed and everyone's looking at you going, can you can you carry on? And as I've said it before and I meant it, safety has to come first. But um, you know, once you make sure that you're, you know, you're looking after yourself and your team, you gotta keep going. The margins for error are almost, are almost zero. So the mindset within that I think is yeah. is fascinating yeah. and, and something that people yeah. miss. Yeah, your, your, mind, your mindset, yeah, really, really fascinating. I, it seems as though it shifts from the planning phase where you are that big, big blue sky thinker to the execution phase where perhaps it's a lot more about grit and a lot more about just getting your head down yeah. and getting the job done. Absolutely. And, and and I think people always sort of think afterwards that um, I th it's impossible to really sort of share the mindset when you're, when you're in it because you never really have those moments where you think, well, can I keep going or not? Because the harder it gets, the more you're fighting against stopping. So there's never really a moment where you're contemplating, you know, the, you know, where you are. That's why you need a great team around you who are, you know, looking out for your well-being and making sure that you stay safe. When I'm doing solo expeditions, it's a lot harder because you've got to make those decisions yourself. Whereas if my performance team on the supported trips, you know, stop me or pull me, then, you know, I, I completely respect them. They run the trip. But say first time I cycled around the world, completely on my own, sleeping every night through in mosques, going through Iran, under armed escort, going through Pakistan, you know, the... the the crash on the first trip happened when I got to Louisiana and a car hit me. I went over the bonnet and fell on the road. I mean, the reality of that is um, it's very hard to be the athlete, but also to be objective enough on your own situation to, to be able to stop. And I do have concerns about, you know, ultra endurance athletes pushing themselves without support because there comes a point of sleep deprivation where you're cognitively so slowed that you you lose that ability to make rational decisions. I mean, anyone who's done endurance sports will know what I'm talking about. You can go to idiot mode. You just you you have the ability to do the mechanisms of sport, but 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 your mental state is slowed significantly. Did you feel able to to hand off some of that decision making to your team in your second attempt where you had that 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 support around you did you fail find that easy to do given that a lot of your previous trips it was all on you you were completely self-supported yeah I, is that a big transition to I make? did that I did actually I find that okay because um I think it's about having the right team who you can support uh, who you can trust and you know you've got to understand that You've got to test the team. You've got to test yourself before you go anywhere. So, you know, before I set out, you know, around the world the second time, we did a 3,000 mile training ride around the coastline of Britain, London to London via the coast. So 
we knew the team well. They knew their roles, the lines of communication, everything about it. So, um, you know, it wasn't just a case of turning up at the start line and then sort of figuring it out as we went. And I think, think, I think that sort of due diligence and process and testing the plan, you know, is at the heart of the success. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's really interesting. We, uh, Laura, your performance manager, who's also World Extreme Medicine faculty, was our previous guest on our podcast, and she talked about the role of the team in supporting athletes, and and we also reflected on how, as medics, we need to have the right team around us to to help us perform at, at work. Um, that's friends, family, wider community, etc., and, and and how valuable that is in in optimizing your your own performance. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And she's one of the best in the business. I mean, she's, um, she, she's a physiotherapist, but she and been at the last four or five Olympics, but she also happens to have rode the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, for, so, for somebody who knows themselves and has that sort of grit and resolve, it's that, it's what I would call that emotional leadership. You know, if I, it's one thing handing over the nuts and the bolts of a project and saying, right, it's your job to get me around the world. But I'm well aware that when I step out of the RV in the morning, if I smile, everyone smiles. If if I look worried, my team look worried. And those who have got more experience, um, and it goes back to the thing we were talking about 20 minutes ago, about the difference between being valued because of what you do and who you are. Those who have got relevant experience don't need the same level of emotional leadership. They've, they've, they, they can look to themselves for that. And that is hugely powerful. You know, you can't judge a book by its cover. I had one cameraman on the trip who, you know, looked tough as they come. You know, he, had, he always wore his black hoodie and a, a heavily tattooed, you know, a, a ring on every finger. He just, he just looked like he could take anything that life threw at him. And yet, you know, I learned through working with him that, um, you know, he he worked off a very different level of communication than, say, somebody like Laura, who who you would who you would sort of doesn't have that sort of look at all and yet you know because of her life experience didn't need any of that sort of emotional support um and it's not a judgment call on any of my team i'm just being candid about the fact that you line up your team and you think some people need certain ways of communicating or certain emotional leadership or certain support mechanisms around them and not and, and it's not that simple because you don't know where people have been before. You don't know what life experience they bring. And it's nothing to do with what you know. It's it's how accountable you are in a given situation. When I capsized in the Atlantic, I was in a six-man crew. And we'd all been through the training. We were all physically strong. We all knew what to do in a crisis situation. That doesn't for a moment tell you what actually happened when we went the wrong way up. I mean, there was just a, a fundamental underlying assumption that somebody else would do it. So four out of the six in the crew never left the life raft. So to not to not put too fine a point on it, you know, you could say, well, four of the six, you know, weren't in a situation or a mindset to 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 save their own lives. So two of us over the first six hours salvaged all the communication gear, you know, the 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 sat phone, the flares, the VHF, all the kit that would be needed to ha- have us found. And we got out of there. I mean, that was just putting training into into action. And yet we all knew what to do, but, but, but you know, only two out of six did it. And it, it's made me think long and hard since that time how to put my teams together differently because it's not about the classes you've sat in. It's about your self-awareness, one eye in the mirror. How do you see yourself in a given situation? If you're the sort of person that just steps back anytime there's a bit of stress and strain, then... You, 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 you don't get used to shouldering that responsibility. Mm, mm. Well, you use the term emotional leadership. Can you try and define exactly what that is? Um, I mean, leadership is quite often defined as sort of lines of communication. Um, in, but emotional leadership is a far more powerful thing for me. And I don't know the proper terminology. It's just the way I think about it. Emotional leadership for me is the fact that I can stand there and give my team instructions and orders and the rest of it. That is sort of traditional leadership in terms of roles and responsibilities. Emotional leadership is the fact that everyone is looking to me for a bit of reassurance of the plan. They're they're looking to me at the heart of this. So emotional leadership is what makes leadership lonely. 
because when I stood on the start line at Paris at the start of the second cycle around the world, I had this amazing team around me, performance, logistics, and media, all completely bought into my dream and wanting to make it happen with me around the world in 80 days. None of them, and I mean absolutely none of them, would have come up with a plan. You know, they hadn't been the kids since they were 12 years old, pedaling across Scotland and every other trip I've done for the last 25 years. So because I've stepped in, you know, stood in my shoes, I'm more than just, you know, the technical skill set that I've built up. You know, that ability to figure out, you know, ah, that leads to that, that leads to that. You know, when I when I got to the Gobi Desert and I was riding into China, Alex, one of my team, turned to me and said to me, look, Mark, we're going to do this. And I sort of laughed and said, Alex, at what point did you not think we were going to do this? Um, you know, you've been working with me for the last six months. But, yeah. but I think within that sentiment, you understand what emotional leadership is. I was on the start line and everyone was bought into my dream. They understood their job, but they never, ever would have come up with the plan. And therefore, they were looking to me emotionally for the reassurance around what they were doing. Now, so, so many bosses would stand in front of their teams and say, right, team, does everyone understand what we're going to do this year? And they'd go, yes, boss. They don't understand what they're going to do. They understand their job. They understand their role or responsibility based on their life experience. So the reason that a leader is asked to be a leader is because they can see the world differently. They've got a view, they've got a view on the possible. They've got an ability to see the next horizon. They understand how to get the best out of their teams. Now, the team themselves might not be able to see that. So it's the sum of the parts. How do you get the best sum of the parts of your, your team or your HR function? And from that, that's the emotional leadership bit because you can explain it to your team and they'll go, yes, boss, we get it, but they don't. They understand their job and that's not a patronizing sentence. It's just the fact that you shoulder the responsibility that you're going to drive the sum of the parts, every part of this project to, to, a, to a greater extent that, that the team believe is possible. Yeah, that's really, really interesting, Mark. And I think in the same way that you've shown emotional leadership on your trips where things have been really tough and the, the, the way you talk about the, the team looking to you and how your uh, your whole demeanor can inform the the mood across that whole team. I think exactly the same thing is happening in healthcare at the moment. I think society is looking to us as medics um, for us to to stand up and be strong and and just make the best of this situation. I think a lot of the medical press at the moment is really hell bent on a lot of the negative aspects of this. And there are challenges, you know, lack of PPE, lack of testing, um, you know, various government policy that, that has, has been controversial, or you know, all these kind of as aspects that I think is, 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 is the emphasis. And I, I think we've got to be careful that we don't dwell on that, those aspects of this, because the, the, the general public, our patients, they're all looking to us for leadership um, in whatever our respective work setting is. And I think that emotional component to it, the, the, the way that we present ourselves uh, and, and the strength that we show through the work we do is so important right now. Mm. And I think within that, a real filter on communication. So for that, I mean, like the way you think, the way you communicate, and therefore your actions, that is the, that is the human function in order. So people just think it's all one thing. It's not. So when we're put into stressful situations, which, you know, for healthcare frontline workers, you know, COVID is incredibly stressful, but for even for the general public, that degree of stress and uncertainty fundamentally and first and foremost changes the way you think because pressure, sleep deprivation, stress, uncertainty, financial unknowns, like that all, that is just stress in many forms. And that changes the way you think. It sort of narrows your ability to take on new ideas. It narrows and hardens your thinking. It, becomes, it makes you much more binary. And, and therefore, the next step is how you then sort of reiterate that back to the world around you your close family your colleagues and whatever else so that changes depending on how you're sort of dealing with that stress and then your actions you know your actions don't happen by themselves they happen as a function of you know the way you're thinking and the way you're communicating so i said it before one eye in the mirror the more we are aware especially when we've got these responsibilities of the information we're taking in and the way we are dealing with it, that the, the 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 more effective we are you know we're not we're not just going about life in autopilot you know the the only thing we can decide and i know it sounds a bit obvious the only thing we can decide in a period like this is 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 our attitudes and our priorities so if we 
if if we constantly sort of think, well, regardless of the stress that's been thrown at us, what we throw back at the world, you know, look at the, the arrows. I always sort of visualize the arrows. You know, whatever we throw back at the world is a conscious choice. Um, it allows us to sort of filter and, you know, affect rather than just sort of be a mirror. If it's a ton of stress and negativity that's coming your way and you're just reflecting that back at everything and everyone around you, then it's very hard to change your reality. And I know that sounds a bit glib and obvious, but it's worth thinking about. Mm-hmm. I, that, that concept of self-awareness, I, I, I think that's such a key part of effective leadership. How would you suggest that the leaders in healthcare today can develop their self-awareness? Do they need to cycle 18,000 miles around the world or are there other ways that they can achieve <laughs> Yes, that? everyone should cycle around the world. That's definitely the answer, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can start to do what the, the frontline medics, doctors, nurses um, are doing at the moment. I mean, I think like anyone, um, you know, I simply want to say a huge thank you. You know, they're getting maybe not always the, the the support they need but they're they're definitely get, they're, they're definitely getting the 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 love and profile that they deserve for ultimately the job they were trained to do and i know a lot of, i've got so many friends who are doctors who just kind of feel almost a bit sort of abashed and embarrassed by the public attention because they they're simply turning around saying yes it's it's a hell of a situation to deal with but this is ultimately you know what we were trained to do we are simply doing our job and i love that sort of modest response from sort of most of the doctors who I know in terms of sort of leadership responsibilities um for me it's never about sort of you know happy clappy positivity and sort of being driven and being you know some crusader it, it's that's not the world we live in it's about what are the big levers what are you know through the busy noisy juggling worlds that we all live what should we actually be focused on? How can we go through our day-to-days in a more effective way to create more impact? Simple as that. So if we can just have a level of objectivity on our own day-to-day functions and you know communicate slightly clearer, just cut through some of the noise, just get good at saying no, don't do stuff, which is not helping you know the core purpose. If we can have better clarity, then we can become more productive human beings on an individual level. So I think a lot of productivity in businesses and organizations just get lost in in noise. And it's, if you're a leader, do everything you can to cut the admin, cut the bureaucracy, cut cut the process from the people who report to you. Do everything you can to unbind their hands and give them the free reign to really focus on what they're good at. That is the responsibility in leadership. You know, just give people time to focus on how they can make the biggest difference. Simple. Yeah, yeah. I can see you're clearly you're, you're uh, very aware of the emotional components of leadership, the, the nuts and bolts, the uh, very, you're very pragmatic, clearly, as a leader. But there, I also sense there's a kind of almost childlike quality about what you do in that that boy who cycled um, across Scotland at the age of 12 and did Land's End to John O'Groats by 15. I think it still seems to be very strong with, within everything that you do. And, and you've previously said that it's the kid inside of you is wondering how fast you can really go. And, and some of the stuff you've done has been quite playful. Uh, you tried to set a world record on a penny farthing. Um, tell us about that kind of slightly playful, almost childlike quality that that's still so strong within within everything. There's you the do. penny farthing one. <laughs> it's on the wall. Uh, yeah, pride of place for sure. Like I love the history of sport. I love the history of exploration. I think we've got a rich history in Britain of going out there and trying to do stuff that's not been done before. So I try and do my bit to 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 continue to write that history. Um, yeah, for sure. I'm the kid that never grew up. Ask my dad, and he doesn't think doesn't think I've got a job yet. Um, I I've always been in a hurry. I've always been trying to push firsts and uh, fastests. But um, I just love that idea. You know, we're seven billion people. The idea of doing something which has not been done before. You know, I, I'm. If you were to ask me what I'm most scared of, and this is a very sort of arrogant thought, I guess. I I hate the idea of not of not sort of doing something to define my own life. Like I hate the idea of of not doing stuff which, if there was no profile, if there was no 
public, you know, documentaries, books, and the rest of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of petrified of not doing stuff which I think is career defining and life affirming. I, I'm just we live in we live in a planet which is so crowded and on a very individual basis you know i want to do stuff which i don't want to feel like i'm living life in cruise control i'm i'm very scared of uh of having an unremarkable life which sounds like a weird thing to be scared of but you know do you know what i mean I, i'm not doing that for fame or fortune i'm doing it because there's a kid inside me who was homeschooled who never had a you know didn't have a telly a normal sort of social relationships growing up my friends were my sisters until I was 12 but I still was just fiercely determined to do stuff which sort of defined each period like I don't want to just exist I don't know how to better put that so that that's the kid inside me yeah fantastic um and I've got a couple of other more specific questions things that I wondered about Mark, just looking through the various trips that you've you've done, um, why you know given, given that you've done all that cycling, why did you choose to pivot towards rowing, and and why specifically the magnetic North Pole, the Arctic? Um, okay, so I, I I cycled around the world the first time, and then I wanted to simply to cross the oceans as well. I mean, it's no more complicated than that, <laughs> and uh, I I, tr- I plan to start with. Um, that expedition never came off. So then the BBC came back to me and said, "Would we need a cameraman to join a trip through the high Arctic? Would you go on that? So they needed an athlete who could. So I mean, my, my wish to learn with in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean ended up being learning to row in the high Arctic, which is not an easy place to learn to row a boat. But it was a fascinating trip called, called Rowing the Arctic. We went 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle and a real bittersweet success because... You shouldn't be able to do it. I mean, now, eight years on from that, you could sail up there every summer holiday. You know, the ice cover is changing drastically. So there's a point that people had only ever walked to or skied to, and now you can suddenly take a boat up there. So um, beautiful. I mean, rowing along with ice fields around you, with pods of beluga whales, rowing past, you know, herds of elephant seals up on the beach. I mean, it was, you know, polar bears swimming around you. I mean, it was a couple of months without seeing humans and just in uncharted territory, which I loved, but there was that sort of underlying feeling that this shouldn't be possible. Mm. Wow. And you're a vegetarian and you've traveled through lots of places around the world where perhaps vegetarianism isn't really a thing. How have you managed to pack in the calories? I mean, 6,000 calories a day, for example, when you're cycling, how, how have you managed to achieve that on a, on a vegetarian diet in various parts of the world or have, or haven't you? Yeah, no, I've, I've, it's, it's not been strict. It's not been possible to. I mean, if you live in the UK or you live in North America and Europe, you could absolutely define your life by, you know, the, the, the food source you can get. But um, certainly traveling alone, solo, the length of Africa, the length of the Americas, you know, that was a nine month expedition, that one, um, you know, big projects. I mean, I've, the expeditions have taken me to 130 countries in the last, um, 15 years or so. So uh, it's been impossible to maintain a strict vegetarian diet. So I've gone through periods where, you know, I've, I've almost been completely plant based, you know, not just vegetarian. And then there's other periods where, you know, just through necessity, I've ended up eating crikey, boiled hen's feet in Thailand and, un, you know, undefined meat stews on the Afghan Pakistan border. I, like, I was grew up on the farm hunting and fishing i never had a an issue in terms of um in terms of you know being able to 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 you know go out there and say make a rabbit stew myself and catch the rabbit and do the whole process that's never been an issue for me i just care deeply about a what i put in my body so how processed the meats are and um so i'll only I'd only ever really, yeah, it's difficult because sometimes in extreme situations on expeditions, you have to just eat whatever you can find. But, and I also care deeply about the impact of, of, of farming mm-hmm. uh, on the planet. So, you know, it's... Um, have there been moments of ethical dilemmas where the, the needs of the expedition are perhaps at odds with your own principles and you have to kind of balance those, those two in your head? Yeah, yeah. I'm quite practical. I, I I never actually define myself as vegetarian. I'm 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 plant plant based most of the time. But when I don't have an option, uh, I um 
you know, I, 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 I still eat, but I, I think I, I, I eat as cleanly as I can. And, you know, I, I do the whole family. Yeah. And you, you had, so how many countries, Mark, remind me, have you traveled through during your adventures? Um, including all the Commonwealth nations and territories, I think we're about 130, 140. 140 countries. Wow. Um, I mean, many people might ask, you know, your driving force has been uh, to really blast through these countries to really kind of push the, the, the limits of, of human capabilities and find where where that is. Many people will be wondering, well, would you not have wanted to stop along the way and, and, and drink in the view, drink in the cultural experiences? Uh, have you ever felt felt that? Yeah, for sure. On some trips, I've been able to, you know, when I was doing the Americas trip, there was definitely more time off the bike to even Africa, but I mean, I'm still pushing it pretty hard. I mean, the Africa world record, but there's a, there's not a speed you can go out on the bike where you're not tuned into the world around you. You know, that's the wonderful thing about the bike. You know, even if you're doing 240 miles a day, you get to, okay, you're seeing the world like a slideshow. I'd be a, I'd be a rubbish nomadic traveler. I've got great friends like Al Humphreys and whatnot, who would happily spend three, four years pedaling around the planet. You know, they get to a junction and they wonder whether they should turn left or right. I, I couldn't do that. I'm not, you know, they always, take the mick out of me for ruining a journey for going so damn fast. And, uh, you know, and I always take the mick out of them for, for you know, for, you know, their, 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 their lack of bike ability <laughs> uh, and lack of training and lack of process. So, you know, I, I always sort of joke that, you know, if, if you actually did some training, you might be quite quick, but it's, um, <laughs> for, for me, there's no wrong way to ride your bike. Just, get out there and ride your bike. It's just, you know, whether it's just to get about or to see the world or to spend time with your friends, there's not all sports are born equally. The wonderful thing about cycling and walking and running is that, you know, for me, first and foremost, yes, I'm a record breaker and I'm trying to push my personal bests, but it's really a tool to see the world. You know, that that's it in a nutshell for me. So I've got the rest of my life to go slower and to take the kids back and explore places, but I wouldn't, you know, for all... For all the millions, I would not swap the journeys over the last 15 years. It's given me an extraordinary access and it's been a real privilege yes. to, to travel the world. Yes, now it's certainly incredible journeys that, that you've been on. And I, I'm like you, Mark, I'm a huge advocate for cycling. We, we we have a car that we very rarely use. Luckily, we live in a city. So I, um, as, a, as a GP, I cycle to work and to all my home visits. And I feel that there's a lot more richness in doing that just on a day to day basis. I just get more out of of those journeys because you, you, you're just you are drinking in the world as you're as you're kind of flowing through it on a bicycle. There's something a lot, a lot purer in being on a bike than being stuck in, in the cabin of a, of a vehicle. I, I think it's the, I think it's definitely the source. It's the, it's the way forwards. Yeah. Yeah, you never you never regret a bike ride. You sometimes have to yeah. motivate yourself to go on a bike ride, but you never regret having been on one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Mark, tell us what's next. You've got a couple of projects uh, on the go. Uh, as a uh, you know, many people in lockdown, you're 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 very frantically busy working on new things and yeah. you're doing some fundraising for NHS charities. Tell tell me about that. Yeah. So uh, every Thursday, we've got a project called World in a Day. So just go to worldinaday.com. The concept is incredibly simple. Anyone who has a home trainer, be it a you know a, a, a you know a a turbo trainer, a treadmill, a Concept 2 rowing machine. If you have the ability at home to clock your miles, every Thursday, I'll be leading the charge. Jenny Graham, the female round the world record holder is also a part of this. And we're gonna clock up our miles and donate our miles. Simple as that to NHS charities. How many times can we get around the planet? So there's a core peloton who are gonna put a big stint in. So keep in mind, I did 240 miles a day. If we can get a core group of riders to do a big stint, a 240 mile day on their turbo, but you don't have to do that. You could do five miles, you could do 15 miles, you could do 50 miles, whatever you can manage and just simply donate your miles. That's great. So anyone that's inspired by by Mark's journey, if, if you if you want to ride, ride around the world too as part of a team and join Mark in doing that, get involved. And it, every, every Thursday, there'll be an online community, you know, hashtag donate your miles. Yep. Um, how many times can we get around the world? I had somebody get in touch and offer to match fund the first 50,000 miles that we managed to do. So there's a 50,000 pound check there ready to be signed if we can clock up 
50,000 miles, 50,000 pounds, so that we're immediately at the 100,000. You know, we can create real impact through this. But also during the weeks of lockdown, for those of us who are sat at home and want to make a difference and want to have a sense of well-being and training and purpose, let's just get those whole miles done. So, yeah, that's that's something I'm leading. We're, we're, we're kicking that off. Yeah, it's um, so great to see just positive initiatives like that happening during lockdown. And you've also got a book on its way out and a new series of podcasts on endurance. Tell us a bit about that, Mark. Yeah, so the life I've led for the last sort of, well, more than 15 years now is all about endurance, pushing. And it's not only a small part of that is physical training. A lot of it, as we have discussed on this pod, is logistics it's mindset it's it's um you know just a far wider skill set you know fundraising my goodness it's all the aspects which allow people to endure now that doesn't need to be for a cycle around the world it's just simply creating the time and space and opportunity to push yourself um a bit further we can't all be power athletes we can't all be sprinters but we can all endure we can all go further we can all turn our 5k into a 10k we can all turn our 100 miler into a Land's End John O'Groats. The ability to go further is rarely sort of defined by your physical ability. It's why when it comes to endurance, there's not really a big difference between male and female, young and old. It's far more about, you know, your personality and your life experience. So anyway, I'm going to write a book about endurance. Um, really to sort of take that to bits and help people push their abilities. And it doesn't need to be as a cyclist. And I think this will be useful to a lot of people. But by way of research, I'm going to spend the next two, three months having conversations just like this with loads of experts in their field. So it could be a strength and conditioning coach. It could be a physiotherapist. It could be a sleep specialist. It could be anyone who has a wise word to say about the topic of endurance. So I'll record all those interviews as a series. It will simply be called Endurance Conversations with Myself. And um, we'll put that out as a podcast series. But those words of wisdom and those thoughts will get woven into the book as well. So if you're listening to this podcast, the World Extreme Medicine one, and you've got you know either an anecdotal life experience or an academic bit of knowledge and, and expertise which you think is relevant to the subject of endurance and you want to you want to bring that to the table, you know, fantastic, get in touch because it's going to be happening, you know, I'll be, I'll be writing it between now and August and then the book will be out by year end. Oh, sounds like a great, great project, Mark. And if people do want to get in touch, how can they do that? Uh, the simplest way is simply through social media. I'm very easy to find, Mark Beaumont, so, uh, or through my website, uh, markbeaumontonline.com. So, just find me online, drop me a note and reference the fact that you have you were listening to the World Extreme Medicine podcast and you're you're in touch about the endurance book. And yeah, let's let's get you on. Great stuff. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Yeah, it's been a great chat. Thanks, Will. 